we're back in uh, our study on the Sermon on the Mount. But we'll reference a little bit of our Acts 1-8 conference as well. Did you guys have a uh, great time at the conference? Amen? Thank you, God. And we truly uh, we pray for the things that God did, and God definitely uh, worked in many people's lives, so to God be the glory. And, and of course, that's a few moments in time, a few minutes in time when, when uh, we gather for a special time set apart. But it's uh, what goes on afterwards. You know, any revival that's found in the scriptures, and, and uh, it always started with just a small bunch, usually one person getting their heart right with the Lord, and, and then another and another. And, and so uh, revival... Uh, a camp meeting, an old conference, whatever it may be, uh, that is, uh, ought to be just a, a starting point, a, a catalyst for a life change. And so thank you all for being part of it. Thank you for all the pieces and parts that went into making it a success behind the scene, most of all the prayer, and uh, how people prayed for God to uh, have his way, and, and he did in so many ways. Thank you to uh, Pastor Brian. Uh, Pastor Bobby, Pastor Alex, and each one of the men of God that preached and taught the Word of God. Thank you for uh, Tammy Calloway and uh, Crystal Chippy for just really pouring out your hearts and, and really just delivering uh, God's message, God-centered message from, uh, from their lives in the mission work that God's called them to. And uh, so thank you, Lord. And uh, we really, truly... Uh, declared the goodness of God. Um, if you recall, and yes, we're going to go into Matthew 6, and we're going to continue in the Sermon on the Mount, life in his kingdom. But if you recall that verse uh, from Proverbs 20, and you're reminded of the, uh, the theme of the conference, Uncommon, these banners will be up all year, the list of missionaries that we support on those banners, banners throughout the hallways. It, it's a a refreshing reminder of what God has done, not to stay in the past, but rather to ignite and say, okay, God worked in my heart in that, or God put me in a place of this, and, and I made a decision about this, and I decided to do this, and okay, God, and uh, one of the pieces and part about it is the, the uncommon faithfulness, and, and again, Bobby uh, used... Uh, uh, different passages of scripture, but centered back to uh, after his testimony. It was tremendous of what it took to be that faithful man and that faithful woman on the, on the field with his family and commitment and endurance and on and on. Those are tremendous simple principles that are very, very powerful in the Lord. And of course, uh, with Brian and using the bookends, the bookends of righteousness, the bookends of intimacy, and, and then of course, uh, it, was, it was really neat. Uh, where did Pastor Alex go? Is he around here somewhere? Did he... There he is somewhere. Aha, there you are. There you are. And you're, I remember when you were thinking, okay, you said, God, what should I preach? And then you were going to look through the Bible, and then God brought you back to the verse. And then he went back and back, and well, what God would you want me to preach? And so thank you for how you listened to the Lord, and each one of the men did to, to preach and teach the Bible. And uh, the music, the time of singing and celebrating the Lord and praising God and having a singleness of heart and a gladness of the heart that was, uh, that found, that's found in Acts chapter number 2. You think, wow, that was really, really good. Keep in mind what it says in the first part of this verse, though. Leading up to, but a faithful man who can find. And we spoke of that, and, and each one of them spoke of that a great deal. It says... Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. And when we look at the Sermon on the Mount and return back to our study in life in his kingdom, we're reminded that there were many people in the crowd that Jesus Christ was speaking to. How do I know that? Because of the message that he was speaking and the words that he said to them and how he addressed them. And when you look at Matthew 5, 6, and 7, Jesus Christ says oftentimes, ye hypocrites, ye Pharisees, ye scribes, he labels them names that really, truly 
go back to a faithful person that's finding faithfulness in their own righteousness and not the righteousness of God. And as we've looked at this series and teaching through it, and we know that the premise, of course, is the kingdom of heaven and how Jesus Christ is revealing to them that if your righteousness can't even exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, hey, here, you know, no case, enter into the kingdom of heaven. Say, well, of course, that's for the Jew, and that's really lined up for them. But he also says, and our, um, our artwork in seeing this, the highlight verse, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you, and you realize that he's mentioning the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. Please remember, doctrinally, theologically, you cannot interchange them. You will get in an awful lot of trouble. The kingdom of heaven, of the physical, and the coming kingdom that God is going to put together in the millennial reign. And also, too, as you look at what the kingdom of God means, and this is just a, a simple Reader's Digest version, that the kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom that you are born into when you're born again. You're a new creature in Christ. Old things passed away. You are of your old kingdom. You are now of the kingdom of God. And you just seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Just a reminder for you and me as we get into Matthew chapter number 6 that the audience that Jesus has, again, is the multitudes. But it's also to the disciples. The disciples are sitting there saying, Oh, you just called us, Jesus, and what's it going to be all about? What's the call of following you and making uh, you making us fishers of men? What's that going to be like? Well, there's a good little peek into the way it's going to be because Jesus Christ's standard is himself. And Jesus Christ, as he makes his standard clear, he points himself to the Father in heaven. And this morning we're going to see how the reference of pointing to his Father in heaven really manifolds itself in, excuse me, manifests itself in our message, proclaim the Father's goodness. Think about again our theme verse. Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man who will find. This morning I wonder if we really can get a handle on a setting that is probably really close to 2,000 years ago. And Jesus Christ is speaking to a crowd and saying, your religious ways, your hypocritical way, your pharisaical, scribe-like, taking the words of God, the old covenant, the commandments and laws, and twisting them to fit... What you would then work out as your own religious, pharisaical righteousness is not the way that God meant things to be. Let me show you how that you have to be lost first to understand being saved. How you have to understand that your righteousness are as filthy rags before God and that you cannot save yourself and you cannot declare your own righteousness before God as being the payment that is necessary. Proclaim the Father's goodness. Let's watch and see and witness the scriptures unfold for us and how Jesus Christ points to the Father this morning and shows us how to proclaim the Father's goodness. Let's start in verse number one and read the text and get a real good idea of where God would have us go. We're going to cover the first 18 verses. Take heed that ye do not <clears throat> your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Isn't that kind of uh, sarcastic of the Lord Jesus Christ that, hey, if you do your alms, your charitable deeds, and you do it with a sounding trumpet, all you're doing is declaring yourself like the hypocrites do in the synagogues. Here's Jesus Christ just kind of poking at them. He says in verse 3, When thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret himself 
shall reward thee openly. Verse 5, he's just covered charitable deeds. What, is, what do we see next in chapter number 5? Because here's just a simple up on the screen outline, but this is what we have in the passage because now he's going to talk about prayer. When thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. There's that word hypocrite again. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to the Father, thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Verse 8. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask, before ye ask him. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Often this is referred to as the Lord's, Supper, uh, Lord's Prayer. This is the disciple, excuse me, this is the, the way that the disciples should learn to pray. It could be called the disciple's prayer. The Lord's Prayer you'd find in John 17. Think about how this type of setting here reveals to them and points to them something that is common even in today's religions in different places to have repetitive prayers and even take this statement that Jesus is saying, verse 9, after this manner, therefore, pray ye. He didn't say, after these words, repeat them. He said, after this manner, I'm giving you the way in which you should pray, not the exact words that you repeat. So he goes on. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if... Ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So now he's covered something on prayer. Here's the third piece, fasting. <clears throat> Verse 16. Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Here's that secretly versus openly principle. Verse 17. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head and wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seest in secret shall reward thee openly. Now join me for a moment in prayers we get into God's word and this passage of scripture. Father, truly, we proclaim your goodness right now. You are holy and you are glorious. Lord Jesus Christ, at the right hand of the Father, thank you for being our mediator, our intercessor. Thank you for the teaching of the word of God, specifically since this scripture is profitable for doctrine and reproof. It's all profitable, but this is your sermon, and we want to teach it, preach it through according to your way. So, by your Holy Spirit, please teach us your word. I mean that, Lord, serious, deeply. I do not want anything to come out that is of me, but rather of you. So please, by the Spirit's teaching ministry, make all things happen according to your will, for your glory, we honor you for your word, and please, God, speak to each person as only you can. In Jesus' name, amen. We have a simple outline on the screen. And of course, <clears throat> from verse 19 down through the end of the chapter, Jesus Christ will take care of how to handle wealth. And then the first few verses of chapter number 7, he'll cover judgment, how to judge others. Oh, we can't all wait for that one, can we? <laughs> You're not supposed to judge me. How are you going to teach that, Pastor? Well, I'm going to make some things up like I normally do. We're going to teach the Bible. What does the Bible say? What does the Word of God say? 
It's interesting what the Word of God says this morning in chapter number 6. Again, remember that Jesus Christ in chapter number 5, we go back a couple of weeks, of course, in our two-part sermon, but we highlighted in chapter number 5 this, this, this phrase, but I say unto you, but I say unto you, but I say unto you. After stating the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, stating the law, stating the commandments, stating the precepts, stating everything, he then said, but I say unto you. Well, look at what he does here in the first few verses of chapter number 6. But when thou, but thou, you look at verse number 3, and you see him saying that phrase. But when thou doest alms. He says there in verse number 6, but thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. He's saying, hey, I see what you do and how you're doing it, but this is the way it ought to go. So let me point out, again, all scriptures given by Inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. Let me state the doctrine. Reproof. Let me point out what is wrong. Correction. Let me give you the right to fix the wrong. Good? Are we good? Simple, right? And then we have reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. How do I do righteous living? How do I live in Jesus and in his grace and his mercy. Well, he shows us through the word of God. And Jesus is saying specifically in this setting, but thou, when thou prayest, verse number six, and then of course in verse number 17, but thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head. He's telling you, this is the way yet, but pay attention to what you really should be doing and how you should be really doing it. And God is using, again, this sermon on the mount to clarify that all scripture is laid out for us to grab the doctrine, the reproof, the correction, and the instruction in righteousness. There's something else that goes on here. Jesus Christ also points to the Father. He proclaims the Father's goodness. He points to the Father throughout this setting here. And as we see this morning, a look at how Jesus is teaching, again, the disciples that are close, but also to the the multitudes that are around, he's using this term father. Now, I thought you couldn't call God your father unless you had a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and you came to know Christ. That is true. But as many as received him, then may be power to become, what? The sons of God. So you then are told that you have a father in heaven. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, 1 John, that we would be called the sons of God. That comes when you receive Christ, all things became new, and one of the new things is that you're now a child of God. Then you have the honor of talking to the Father in heaven, but don't forget the other part of this. Jesus Christ is teaching about fatherhood, about God being Father. He's also pointing to them, hey, You know that the father of the nation of Israel is God, Jehovah, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nisi. He is father of the nation of Israel. You say, what about Abraham? Well, they get into that little tete-a-tete and fight later on down the road because the Pharisees, of course, went after Christ in that area as well. But he clarified that. And if you see in verse number 1, 4, by the way, that 5 is supposed to be a 6, but 1, 4, 6, 8, 9, 14, 15, 18, you see the phrase, your father, thy father, our father. He's constantly proclaiming the goodness of the father. When you and I really stop and understand the depth of the father-son relationship between Jesus Christ and Father God, it's so very, very powerful. I'll give you about 100 years walking with God to really get a, a, just a tiny bit of a glimpse of what it's like to be for you and me, just like Jesus Christ in that area of calling God the Father. Some of you look at things and go, he's my Father, yeah. Thank you, Father, you're so good, amen, da 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 Sadly, we read about Jesus Christ and his incredible closeness to his Father in heaven. And if you read the depth of the Gospels and understand that Jesus Christ had the Spirit of the Lord upon him, but also in him, and that he, in the triune God unity, 
had the power of Almighty God, but that Son of Man, Son of God, that theological package right there, passed on to you and me as joint heirs with the Son to be a Son of God. In this setting, it just hits you. It has to strike you to say, wait a minute here. Why would I not live like that? Not in the place where you get all the jewels and all the royalty. I get that about being a son of the king and all that. But what about your responsibility and my responsibility to acknowledge the Father and proclaim his goodness this morning? Because I fear today more than ever in the 21st century that the church has a way of grabbing the proclamation that's deserved to God Almighty as our Father for themselves. Behold what manner of love. The Father is given to us. Jesus Christ is saying, you hypocrite, you liar, you fake, you phony, who know so much about the Bible, Pharisee, scribe. Let me ask you, do you like being called a liar? Do you like being called a hypocrite? You wouldn't want that. You wouldn't like that. This morning, for just a few moments, you and I capturing what it means to proclaim the Father's goodness is not just giving the Father a tip. Hey, thanks, Dad. Man, upstairs, you're really cool. Oh, if you grew up in the religion that I grew up in, oh, the defamation and wickedness that God was treated as. The men upstairs. Remember, Steve, the stuff that we grew up in? It's awful to denigrate and degrade God who is now your Father and God who's your Savior, Jesus Christ. Most men will stand up and say, ha, I'm pretty good. But a faithful man, who shall find? Who are you going to proclaim today, this week, this month? Because it's coming. Your faith is being tested. Your sonhood's being tested. Your daughterhood's being tested. Your heir with the king is being tested. Who are you going to proclaim? Who am I going to proclaim? Who are we going to proclaim? Because it's getting closer and closer to the son returning for his church. But until he does... You and I better be proclaiming the goodness of the Father. Well, he's a good father. He's a good dad. Come on now. He deserves a little bit more than a tip. Jesus teaches his Father's will with power and conviction here to the religious people of the day. Watch out that we don't and aren't looking like the religious people of the day. You say, well, we're converted in Jesus and I'm going home to see Jesus and everything's going to be fine. Now I'm just going to live whatever way I'm going to. You ought to check yourself. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, that you have a love one for another. Greater love hath no man in this, that he laid down his life for his friends. How are we doing on that one so far? Jesus Christ says, I'm going to give you a new commandment. New commandment? What are you talking about? Love? (laughs) Why don't you love as I have loved? His new commandment was that he laid down his life. That he paid the price. I wonder sometimes... When we say we're going to proclaim the Father as our Father and the goodness, we don't just blow it off instead of looking and seeing, wow, Jesus, thank you for your example of how you did it. Jesus Christ did a few things. You can write down these references and you can look at them on your own study time. I always got to give you some homework. Matthew eleven twenty-five 25 through 27. Here's a reference of the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, being tested, being pushed. Who are you? Who are you? All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Guess who he's referencing? It's his Father. It's his relationship with the Father. And you have access to the same relationship. Hey, Pharisee in the setting, you have no access without me making the way for you. So understand that all of your almsgiving, all of your prayers in public, all of your fasting for show mean nothing to my Father because I know him. 
and I was sent by him. It says in John chapter number 8, verse number 25 through 30, up on the screen it says, Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, whew, when ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he. And of course, in that context, just before in verse number 25, it says, Then said they unto him, Who art thou? And Jesus saith unto them, even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. I've been saying this from the beginning, from the foundation of the world. I've been saying it from the moment that I created the heaven and the earth, heavens and the earth. I, I am saying it for you to know that I am he, Jesus Christ. Of course, in John chapter number 10, familiar? Yes? He just said, know that I am he. He said those seven I am statements, but he also said I am also. Don't forget there's an eighth in there. He did say, I am. I am that I am. He declared himself, I am. And he says in John 10 that he is the door for the sheep. He says that he is what? The good shepherd. He also says that I have come to give life and I give it more abundant. He says also too in John chapter number 10, as the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep because of my relationship with God the Father. My relationship is the Son of the living God. And because I am the Son of Man and the Son of God, I know the Father, and you can and ought to know who he really is. And in that preaching context, again, just move this to a place of personal application and say, Father, wow, I've missed it. Well, let's not miss it anymore because a lot of religions are portraying this father to child relationship as if it's just fine for everybody to say, okay, we're all gods and we're all fine and there's not going to be any judgments and, and, and the things are going to be good. And the greatest part of life and being given life is that this is everything and this is it. And when you go to the grave, that's it. Mm. And people leave. This life, not knowing Jesus as Savior and not knowing God as the Father of their lives. You believers today, you that are listening to the Word of God being preached today, please understand that proclaiming the Father's goodness doesn't come again by just saying, hey, thank you, Father. Now, we are to give thanks to the Father. Well, give give some dollars at the church. Yes, yes, we're not. Well, I'm supposed to pray some too to my father. Yes, yes. As a child of God, I'm supposed to let the father know my needs. Yes, yes, yes. And fasting, is fasting important? Yes, because it, it gives me a, an opportunity to take away those physical necessary foods so that I can see him as being my necessary food. Yes. But when it comes right back to it, comes right down to it, Jesus Christ is calling them hypocrites and liars. I pray that I would not be in that same category with him. Let's walk through these three pieces now for a moment and make some personal application. Because I know many of you are here today for our baby dedication at the end. And I know that that's on your mind and heart. But let's think about the father-child relationship now. Because the father pointing your little babies to the Father in heaven, parents. Oh my. Through the Lord Jesus Christ, there's no better thing you can do than have your child understand who God is and how he can become their father. It says in the first few verses, first four, looking at those, in verse number four, that thine alms may be in secret and thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. What have we got here? Well, giving is between you and God. Period. When the third, third party or somebody else gets involved and messes with us. Now we're talking about charity. We're talking about a charitable alms giving. An extra thing. There's somebody that you want to bless. You want to do something for someone. 
Well, that's tremendous and wonderful. It's beyond just knowing that you have to do that giving, which is important. We're not talking about, hey, well, I just need to make sure that this commitment's in, and I'll, I'll, I'm going to send pastor an extra email to let him know. By the way, this basket should be filled up in the month of October with the commitment cards for us to be able to say we're going to support missionaries and we're going to give to, if God would allow and God leads you, to the special offering for Kafula Futa to bless Pastor Pule. But that being the case, this almsgiving, they used to stand, as it says there again, I mentioned it earlier in verse number 2, Jesus says, Hey, therefore when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet. No, no. Jesus Christ says in verse number 13, excuse me, verse number 3 this. He says, you know, when the right hand goes into the paqueta over here, and it's looking for something, he says, okay, don't look, uh, don't, don't look, don't look. See, the left hand wants to find out what the right hand's doing. And the left, right hand goes in there, and he says, don't let the left hand know what's in there. Don't let the left hand, don't be sounding a trumpet. Right hand, go over and give that. Left hand, you don't need to know what's in there. Left hand may know what's in there and say, hey, I want a little something for that and tell people what I did. The picture is very simple. When you and I do that which God would have us to do in proclaiming the Father's goodness, we give this way. Not to proclaim our own goodness, but rather to proclaim the Father's provision and blessing. If you have $50 to do for somebody, maybe a tank of gas, maybe a couple of, a few bags, I think like 50 bucks might get you two bags of groceries at the store now, right? Eh, maybe one bag, I don't know. If it's a nice big piece of meat, maybe some ribs, right, my son? You could get some ribs, that'd be good. But here's the thing. The proclamation of the Father's provision and blessing supersede you and I saying, hey, I had a chance to do something. And then the left hand, it went and told, no, 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 put, put, no, 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 no. Just go do it. No one needs to know. You don't need to proclaim your own goodness. You and I do not need to say, well, I had a chance to, da, 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 da. hey, the praise of men is something the 21st century church is filled with. And the almsgiving was and is an issue for them as well. We, we, we look at things and we go, wait a minute, I need to just make this right and real and transparent with God the Father and the receiver of the gift and say, now, now real quick, not every gift has to be anonymous. I mean, Barnabas sold his land and gave it and they knew about it. I'm not saying every single thing's anonymous, but I am saying this. When it comes to this principle, just allow God to know. Just allow the person that received it, and even if you don't want that person to receive it, the beautiful part about that is this, that our sinful nature doesn't get a chance because it's so subtle. It wants to mess with us a little bit, and it wants to take away the goodness from the Father when we reach into the pocket and do something sweet. It's just very simple. Proclaim the Father's goodness. Let him be known to give all that he has given to you and provided for you and given you the opportunity and blessed you on and on. It's a powerful, powerful thing. It's a beautiful way to go about your almsgiving, your extra doing something for somebody giving. How about verses 5 through 15? The principle of prayer. You can, there, there's a whole outline of prayer. Praise, petition, provision. You, you got all kinds. You got a beautiful outline there. I got that. But we're talking about verse number 8, 9, 10. We're looking at the principle going up to verse number 5. Be not ye therefore like unto them. Who's them? Those that pray as hypocrites in verse number 5. They love to pray standing in the corners, in the corners of the street, that they may be seen of men. Oh, my. He's saying in verse number 8, be not like them. Don't do that. For your Father knoweth what things you are in need of before you ask him. So why don't you just go to the Father with it? Sounds like a good idea. Why don't we just go to the Father with things? And the other side of it is, how about, as Brian preached on 
Wednesday night, the bookends of intimacy that I get so close to God and I spend time with him enough and enough and more and more and more and more that I get a, get capture this idea, guess what? That I hear his voice and know his voice and when I talk to him, he hears me and knows my voice and we have this incredible intimate relationship. And it's not my, me just saying, well, Father, did you check it out how wonderful a prayer I made for you while I was in public? Whoa. If that's the only place that you pray, mm, it's time to move that thing into intimacy, one-on-one -on -one time, in your closet with God. Proclaim, proclaim, proclaim the Father's goodness. How? In this one. Praying should not be, not proclaim our own goodness, but rather proclaim the Father's will and forgiveness. What do you mean? It's in the scriptures. Verse number 9. Verse number 10. Verse number 11. Thy will be done. We pray according to God's will. What's God's will? To be thankful, not willing that any should perish. Be thankful, giving of ourselves, serving, ministering, the will of God, knowing it. And then, verse number 12, forgive our debts. Lead us not into temptation. Watch out for the place of verse number 14 where I should look at forgiveness from God. Hey, when you and I proclaim the Father's goodness in our area of prayer, we are telling him, thank you for your will, Father. I'll pray according to your will. When I look at the Father's forgiveness, I will pray in my intimate time. And give you all the proclamation of goodness for all of your forgiveness in my life. Jesus didn't say, read these exact words, pray these exact words. He said, in the manner of, as I mentioned earlier, the will of God. What is it? Should I pray according to the will? Of God, yes, and I should proclaim the Father's will and proclaim his forgiveness. Think of this. Someone sent this devotion to me this morning very early. Let me, let me just read a bit of it. Lamentations 341, lift us, excuse me, let us lift up our heart with our hands unto God in the heavens. It goes a little bit like this. This is a, a Spurgeon um, devotion. Let me just read a little bit of it. The act of prayer teaches us our unworthiness, which is a very salutary lesson for such proud beings as we are. I prayed for that, and God delivered it. Who's receiving the proclamation of the Father's goodness there? We must be careful there. There's nothing wrong with sharing a blessing of an answer prayer. That's no problem. It's, we have to be careful how far we go with that prayer credit. If God gave us the favors without constraining us to pray for them, we should never know how poor we are. But a true prayer is an inventory of wants, a catalog of necessities, and a revelation of hidden poverty. Woo! Prayer girds the loins of God's warriors and sends them forth to combat with their sinews braced and their muscles firm. An earnest pleader cometh out of his closet, even as the sun arises out of the chambers of the east, rejoicing like a strong man to run his race. Boy, that's so convicting. Whew. We thank thee, great God, for the mercy seat, a choice proof of thy marvelous loving kindness. Help us to use it aright throughout this day. We must proclaim the Father's will and forgiveness in our place of letting him know that we are thankful and we are pray he is praiseworthy of the honor and privilege of coming to the Father by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ without anyone getting any, any accolades, proclaiming their own goodness, but rather just the Father's. And lastly, as you look at this last section about fasting, keep in mind Jesus Christ is dealing with something that the Jews, again, had perverted. They're hypocrites. Verse 16 says, Moreover, when you fast, be not as hypocrites of a sad countenance. Oh, do you know today, Brother Craig, I, I'm really tired. Why are you tired, Brownie? Thank you for asking. Oh, I'm just worn out from fasting all day. Oh, I wish you could be like me. 
you don't want to be like me. You want to be like Jesus. That thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. The whole principle be behind everything we're talking about this morning in Jesus' message, part, this part of the Sermon on the Mount, is very clear. We need to allow the Lord to truly have the accolades and proclaim his goodness in every aspect. The Pharisees in this setting had got to a point where they just weren't doing the Day of Atonement type of fasting. You know the evil Bobby, when he studied it out, they were saying, well, I'm fasting on Monday, I'm fasting on Thursday. I'm fa- you know I'm fasting all the time, I'm such a wonderful guy. Really? And they would go tell everybody about it. Go study to see what the setting is here that Jesus is dealing with and he's saying, why don't you proclaim the Father's goodness? Because he's saying there again, referencing the Father. That thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Well, i got to give God the Father a list of things that I've been doing as his child this week because I don't think he knows what I've been doing for him. Seriously? How about giving him just all the accolades he deserves? Proclaim his goodness. Don't just sing the song, which is fine. Don't just kind of rehearse a few words. God, you're good, and God, you're great, and thank you for this food. Amen. Whoa, whoa, time out here. You see, we need to proclaim the Father's sufficiency and his approval. My grace is sufficient for thee. My grace is sufficient for thee. My grace is sufficient. on this baby dedication day today as the Lord brings this to my mind. I reminded that it's just a few days before the end of my oldest daughter's life who we dedicated to the Lord. She came to know Jesus as Savior as an eight-year-old. But the battle of her life was knowing that the Father in heaven was sufficient enough. Deep down inside, Jesus Christ was not sufficient. She wanted the Father's approval, of course. Like every one of us want the Father in heaven's approval for doing a good and faithful job, a good and faithful servant. Five days before she left the earth, she wrote in her Bible, I've shared this one other time, my life's verse right next to 2 Corinthians. And you read that and you say, oh, I wish you'd gotten a handle on that a lot sooner. For her, her end was a tragic one. That's not for you to think through. As much as I want you to understand something this morning, as a child of God, as a son of God, as a daughter of God, a believer, listen, you and I need to proclaim the Father's sufficiency. He is enough. Tell him that. You're enough, you're enough, and then live it out. And then say, Father, I do nothing for man's approval, but I do it for your approval. In Jesus' name, amen. We're always looking in the wrong place, and you are no different than these Pharisees right here, the Sadducees, the scribes, the religious people of the day. May we, church, not be found to be the hypocrites, the liars, the fakes and the phonies when it comes to proclaiming our own goodness. We need not proclaim our own goodness. Our own goodness, guess what? It says filthy rags to God. What must happen? Here's your thought for today as we close out. It's personal. This is personal for you. It's personal for me. It's personal for everybody here when it comes to proclaiming the Father's goodness. It's personal to proclaim the Father's goodness. So ask yourself the question, because I put a possessive personal program here. What needs alteration in my life? What needs alteration for proper proclamation in my life?
What needs alteration for proper proclamation? How do I get to a place where I proclaim his goodness all the time? Let's bow for a word of prayer. As we close out our service and have a moment, I want to pray with you and pray for you. Maybe there's something you need to do some business with the Father with, and that's okay. There's a place here you can come and kneel and do that. You can just pray wherever I understand and distancing, but maybe you just want to come forward and spend a little time. Let me just ask you real quick, real quick, as a way of proclaiming the Father's goodness with your heads bowed. Now, this is just, a, this is just an act of, it's just a simple thing. After salvation, uh, show me your works. I'll show you faith. Faith works. So simple. Church, believers, any believers here today, if you know you're saved and, and you're a son of God, you're a child of God, a daughter of God, would you just raise your hand real quick just to let the Father in heaven know, I'm just proclaiming your goodness. Just do it like that. Just to say, I'm proclaiming your goodness. That's it. Now, good, great. Put him down. That's something no one saw. No one saw that but him. That proclaims his goodness. I love it. So what needs alteration in your life and my life for proper proclamation of the Father's goodness? Our Father in heaven, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for this beautiful time that we've had in your word, but also very convicting word. Thank you, Jesus, for being all that we can possibly ever need. And surely, God, we know you are our Father as believers. We know and we thank you, Jesus, for being the author and finisher of our faith. And God, as we think about this end of service time, maybe there's someone that just, just needs to make an alteration. We won't tarry long, but God, I, I just want to open that door for people. So God, in this next minute or two, work on people's hearts. Have your way. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand.